Welcome to lecture eight. So we have laid out the theoretical foundations of static games and extensive form games in the past lectures.、And、in today's lecture, we're going to look at、uh, multi-stage games. Before we do that, let's look at a very classical example of、uh, normal form games, namely Prisoner's Dilemma. Uh, I believe that most of you have heard about it from different um, popular um, science or、uh, just popular culture、um, sources, where we、uh, have two members of a criminal gang who are arrested and imprisoned, and each prisoner is in some sort of solitary confinement with no means of communicating with the other person. Uh, and then the prosecutor lacks sufficient evidence to convict the pair on the principal charge, but they have enough to convict both on a lesser charge.、Uh, simultaneously, the prosecutor offers each prisoner a bargain. Each prisoner is given the opportunity either to portray the other by testifying that the other committed the crime or to cooperate with the other by remaining silent. Remember, they have no means of talking to each other during、uh, this procedure. The possible outcomes are if both players betray each other, each of them serves four years in prison. You can think of it as say、um, the worst、uh, case when、um, both of them has the largest、um, penalty, so the payoff will be five minus four, which is one. If A betrays B but B remains silent, then A will be set free and B will serve six years in prison. And if A and B both remain silent, then they essentially cooperate with each other, and both of them will be served only one year in prison for the lesser charge, right? So that's、um, the setup, and the similar setup has occurred many, many times in numerous places.、Um, so. Uh, how do we analyze the situation? In fact, we have all the tools、uh, that we have introduced in the last lectures to discuss that very easily. We can come up with the matrix for this game. If,、uh, so the players are faced with two options: either to cooperate or to defect. I think the defect may be、uh, seen as some sort of betrayal to the partner. So <clears throat> if they both cooperate. They serve one year in prison, so the overall payoff will be five minus one, which is four for each of them.、Uh, if they both defect, then they serve four years in prison. That would be five minus four, so the payoff will be one. But if one defect, if、um, the other cooperate, then the person who uh, cooperated uh, got a negative one、uh, payoff because. Um, all the charges are laid on this person, so he serves six years. While the other person walk off for free, so the other person will get five.、Um, so each of these、uh, outcomes have negative one five and five negative one.、Uh, and it's very easy to analyze Nash equilibrium in this case if we are、um, just looking at it as a normal static game,、uh, and we know. According to the analysis of strict dominating strategy equilibrium, that there is only one、um, unique outcome, which is DD. So this will push the players both to adopt defection towards each other, and then they will arrive at a globally、um, not desirable outcome. Um, because they will get much higher payoff if they cooperate if they cooperate with each other. So now a lot of I mean since the 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 start of the discussion of this model, a lot of question actually question the、uh, validity of this model because in real life, do people actually follow、uh, what's being predicted? Would mutual betrayal actually happen? In fact, if you think about the cases, there are not、um, a lot of cases where people actually mutually betray because over the course of the development of、um, Social relations, people develop a certain trust in the other person, or simply people adopting some sort of、um, social norm.、Um, in fact, in many studies, including a very recent one by economists in Germany, who tested a group of prisoners 
in Germany, uh, and uh, they asked exactly the same question to the prisoners as experiments. Uh, as a result, only thirty-seven of um, uh, sorry, uh, the, the 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 prisoners actually cooperated with each other in fifty-six percent of the time. Right? So that's um, quite a high number. That means more than half of the prisoners actually do not adopt this mutual betrayal behavior. They also, I mean, the researcher also tested the same set of questions on students, and that they only get 37% of student cooperating. So I think that the students are following uh, what's predicted more uh, accurately than uh, the inmates, which is quite interesting. Um, so the question is, you know, why would uh, natural equilibrium, and not only natural equilibrium, this time we're actually predicting um, strict to dominating strategy equilibrium, um, but why does it go so wrong, right? Because if you look at it as a static game, um, there's nothing more obvious than this, right? People, if they're rational, they should uh, follow uh, their best, you know, optimal uh, responses, uh, and uh, that would be mutual defection, right? Of course, one of the explanations is people are not very rational, but this is not something that we would like to do because um, can we have a explanation of such a, a scenario um, but still assuming people are rational? So there must be some other factors that are influencing people's uh, decisions. And in fact, if we look at the assumption that we make in a typical uh, prisoner dilemma or just normal form games, we assume that the players will have no opportunity to reward or punish their partner other than their prisoner sentence they get, right? This means that the payoff that we um, define in the game are just exactly like what um, are indicated by the matrix. There's no other external factor uh, there's no temporal dimension to this. I mean, the players, um, they play the game once and for all, and they do not care about anything happened afterwards. Right? Um, however, in real life, this is seldomly the case. For example, when two people uh, engage in this interaction, and when one person is being taken advantage of, um, there's a certain chance that this person uh, will um, have some retribution towards the other person. Um, so uh, essentially, people are acting uh, with the consideration of not only the payoff that they get for this time, but for future utility. However, in the classical static game, there is no notion of future utility. Right? And uh, this calls for a need to define a model that take into account of such future utility of the game. Now consider a different, uh, slightly uh, modified version of Prisoner Dilemma, and we call this Prisoner Revenge Game. Right. So now, suppose that these two uh, people who are in prison, they play a two-stage game. In the first stage, the player just play a normal prisoner dilemma game. They're both in the police station, and they have to make the decision for the prisoner dilemma game. But afterwards, there's a second stage. Uh, and there the player will play a revenge game, where the players can decide either to punish the other player or not. Right? So in this revenge game, we have another matrix where the players have two options, either to leave or to punish others. If they both decide to leave, then no harm is done, and both people walk away with zero payoff. But if one of the person leaves and the other person decides to um, to punish the other player, then the person who chose L get a penalty of negative four, right? That's the result of the punishment that player one gets uh, from player two. Well, player two also, because of the punishment, um, player two also has a negative one um, penalty. Uh, and it's symmetrical in the other way around. If both of them uh, decide to punish the other, then they go into a war, and uh, both of them lose uh, three 
uh, as the penalty of the game. Right. So in this game, we can analyze, of course, the single stage, and we get um, that there are two Nash equilibria. There is LL and the PP. Right. So there are these two Nash equilibria of this game, and there are two. Actually, this is not a separate game, right? So when we talk about prisoner revenge game, is no longer a static game. It's a dynamic game because the players engage in the first stage and then they engage in the second stage. Uh, and we need to analyze their behavior of both stages, not just for each single stage. And this means that the most appropriate ways to analyze the situation is through an extensive form game. Right? And to do that, we just need to draw the game tree. And because there are only two stages, still quite uh, short, we have the first stage, which is everything in the top two levels, where the first player can decide on the capital C and D. That's cooperate or defect. And then the second player also decide on C and D and C and D. You can see that there is this information set that links these two nodes because um, we assume in the first stage it's a static game, right? So the agent um, will not, the second player will not be aware of the decision of the first player when he makes a decision. Right. Uh, so that's the first stage. And after the first stage, at each of these nodes, we start to look at the second stage. In the second stage, player play a revenge game. Right, uh, and this means that the first player can either choose L or P, and the second player also choose L and P. And also, they have the because it's a static game in the second stage. We also have these information sets uh, at each of these um, um, pairs of nodes here. Right, um, and uh, what is the actual payoff of the player? Right. Uh, of course, because we have two stages, we have to consider the payoff in both stages. And let's assume for now that the players are interested in the summed payoff of these two stages. Okay. So remember, this is the payoff table for the first game, the Prisoner Dilemma game. And this is the payoff table for the second game, namely the revenge game. So we can combine these two tables uh, to look at, essentially we can have um, 16 possible outcomes. And in each outcome, the payoff for the players that basically the result of combining the payoff the first stage and the second stage. For example, when the player adopts CCLL, we need to look at um, the payoff 4, 4 with the payoff 0, 0. And when we add it up, this will give us 4, 4. When we look at, for example, uh, DDPP, then we need to look at here we have 1, 1. And here we have negative 3, negative 3. Then this will give us negative 2, negative 2. Right. So we can um, draw out the entire game tree with the corresponding payoff value for every outcome. That's um, a representation of these two stage game. <clears throat> now my question is what are the sub game perfect equilibria of this game? The SPEs are determined by the Nash equilibrium of the sub games of the prisoner revenge game. Right. Um, so we want to analyze SPEs. This means that we need to find out all of the subgames. And uh, here we have in exactly five subgames. Right. We have the subgame that's rooted here, which is basically the second stage. And so we have four subgames for the second stage, and we have one subgame for the first stage and the second stage. Right. Um, and uh, we want the players at each game to play their um, Nash equilibrium, right? They play their Nash equilibrium. Um, so, and notice that the strategies at the first stage, namely the, the, the biggest sub game, uh, really depends on the strategies to be committed by the players at stage two. So the question is whether it's possible for the players to declare a strategy at stage two 
so that mutual cooperation can be enforced at stage one, right? And because of the way we arrange stage one before stage two, there's a chance that the decision of stage two actually have an impact on the decision that players made in first uh, in stage one. Um, let's consider the following strategy profile, right? So player one will commit to the strategy LPPP. So this will be at, at, at the second, I mean, if you look at the all of the four sub games that represent the second stage, LPPP says that, well, I will only leave if uh, we have CC in the first stage. If we do not have CC in the first stage, then I will always play punishment in the second stage. And similarly, player two adopt the same strategy, which says, well, I will only uh, leave when we have CC, and in all the other cases, I will play punishment. Right. So both of the player are some sort of uh, holding the um, the 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 strategy that they will uh, let the opponent face consequences if they defect. Right. So your defection will face consequences, and they suppose they declare that to each other. Then let's think about what would actually happen. Right. Um, Remember, in each of these stage games, we have two Nash equilibrium. Either they can play LL or they can play PP. So in, in fact, if you look at the current situation, um, the, the players are playing LL here or PP here and PP here and PP here. This means that in all of these sub games, the players are actually playing in their Nash equilibrium. Uh, and, uh, then also in the first stage, if if you if you analyze the situation, uh, the the payoff for CC would just be four four, the payoff for CD will be negative four two, and the payoff for DC will be four negative four, and the payoff for DD will be negative two negative two. Right, and from the perspective of the players, you can see that. Um, if player one chooses C, then the best response for player two would be to choose C as well. If player chooses D, then the best response for the players will be to choose D for the second player would be to choose D as well. Right? So that's the best response for the second player. But if the second player chooses C, then the best response for the first player is to choose C as well. And if the second player chooses D, then the best response for the uh, first player will be to uh, choose D as well. All right? Um, so. Okay, so you can see that in this case, we actually have an SPE, namely uh, C and C. Uh, so if player one chooses capital C at the first stage and player two also chooses small case C at the first stage, 
uh, and also uh, according to what they declare for the second stage, that will actually be an SPE of the game. Right. So now you can see that even though CC is not a Nash equilibrium in the first stage alone, if we combine the first stage with the second stage, and if the player declare these strategies for the second stage, this will actually push them uh, towards playing CC because now CC becomes a Nash equilibrium in the first stage. Right. Now my question is, well, this is the case when the players are pushing towards mutual cooperation, but is it possible to enforce other behaviors? For example, DC at stage 1. This is when player 1 plays defection and player 2 plays uh, cooperation. Of course, uh, if we just have the uh, first stage and without the second stage this combination of strategies is ridiculous from the point of view of player two okay. uh, but is it possible that with the revenge game attached at the end of the prisoner dilemma game is it possible that eventually we can enforce this behavior so now let's consider uh, the same game tree but uh, the two players would declare different strategies for the second uh, stage. Uh, that would be um, player one declares PPLP, so it means that here we would play P, uh, P, and only here he will play L, and here he will play P, and similarly for player two. So this means that the two players will only leave when the first player plays D and second player plays C uh, in the first stage, right? Uh, if you look at the, the uh, definition of SPE, this is also an SPE because uh, all of the subgame are in Nash equilibrium. Uh, and also, <clears throat> the with the same analysis, you will be able to see that the only Nash about the uh, if you look at the um, strategy profile where in the first stage player one chooses D and the second player chooses C uh, that strategy combined with uh, the declaration and all of these other um, stage games uh, we will uh, uh, see an SPE right so that is also an SPE so there's an SPE where in the first stage the uh, two players will play D and C Right, so that seems to be quite odd uh, and very different from the static game that we have analyzed. All right. um, you can see that the key to the analysis above lies in the revenge game. And unlike the prisoner dilemma game, the revenge game at stage two has two different Nash equilibrium, and this gives the players some room to um, change the outcome of the first stage, right? So um, in the revenge game, there are two NEs, and one of the NE is significantly better than the other, namely leave and leave, uh, and the other NE, although it's an NE, uh, it's actually a very undesirable option where two players go into this war and then they punish each other, right? Uh, and this basically, the, exist the presence of these two NEs will allow the players to offer self-enforcing incentives uh, that supports complying behaviors in stage one, right? So actually, we... Uh, can think of the situation as follow the two distinct equilibria in the second stage act as a stick and a carrot. The stick will be the case when the players punish the other player. And the carrot is when they just leave out. Right? Uh, and uh, the difference in the payoff between the stick and the carrot are large enough to create an impact in the first stage, and this will enable the players to use long-term losses to deter themselves from pursuing short-term gains. And that's 
uh, very classical in management theory uh, in a lot of you know corporates when a management uses this stick and carrot strategy to ensure uh, the coercion of the, to to coerce certain um, um, behaviors from the employees, right? Um, so uh, you either get a award rewarded if you accomplish certain task or you will get punished right? uh, and with this strategy typically we can enforce any uh behavior that we want right so that's that's um that's just a side note to this whole uh multi game multi uh stage game um so we now want to um be more generalized in the discussion. So in the last example, we assumed that the payoff to the player, the summed payoff of uh, the stage, of the, uh, sometimes um, in economics, this is not the case. And most of the economic theory, a well-adopted theory was a discount factor delta uh, that um, is used as f uh, basically a discount for future payoffs. So suppose the agent receives a sequence of payoffs, P0, P1, P2, uh, in different time stamps, the total discounted payoff will be, uh, which is seen at the current moment, right? So, so these are sort of expected payoff that we will receive will be the sum of the P0, P1, P2, but each of the PI is discounted by a factor of delta to the power of I, right? Uh, and uh, for example, uh, if we look at that stage game, the multi-stage game that I gave you, um, so we more generally can write down the payoff function of the uh, all of the outcomes as a function with respect to the discount factor delta, right? So that would be the result in game tree. So now the question is, how does delta affect SPE in this game? We can perform um, some analysis, assume that the players adopt LPPP and LPPP. Remember that was the uh, second stage <clears throat> strategy that enforced mutual cooperation in the first stage. Um, if player one chooses C, the best response for player two is C if and only if four is bigger than five minus three delta. So if you do the calculation, if you analyze the green boxes, uh, you get this conclusion. Uh, on the other hand, if player two chooses the small case C, then the best response for player one is capital C if and only if four is bigger or equal to five minus three delta. So uh, this is, seems to be the only condition that we need in order to uh, ensure that mutual cooperation is um, an SPE in the first stage. Uh, and therefore, uh, the basically, we would need just uh, delta bigger or equal to one over three. So this is reasonable because when delta is um, zero, it means that the players do not care about the second stage at all, right? Uh, and just now we we're looking at the case when delta is one, where there's no discount. So the players are um, uh, finding the payoff of the second stage being having equal weight as the first stage. Um, but uh, in fact, the weight can be lowered down to one third. So as long as the players value the future utility as being around one third as important as the current stage, um, then they would um, choose mutual cooperation as part of an SPE. Right, so that this is basically intuitive what it says. Um, what about um, trying to force the outcome DC in the first stage? Right, we can again do the same analysis, assuming that the players uh, declare the strategies PPLP and PPLP. Right, so so both will declare these strategies at stage two. Uh, then analyzing the blue boxes you'll be able to see that uh, if player one chooses D, the best response for player two, for player two to choose C is, uh, the, you know, this is if and only if negative one is bigger than one minus three delta. Uh, and if player two chooses C, then the best response for player one is D regardless of delta, right? So the only condition that we need is um, this one. Uh, which is equivalent to saying delta is bigger or equal to two over three. So this means that in order to enforce 
DC, it's a little bit harder than enforcing CC in the first stage. The, this require that the uh, players will put a, you know at least the threshold is higher than the other case. So in the other case, we need a threshold of one over three for the discount factor. But in this case, we need a th threshold of only uh, of of um, two over three. So the 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 players need to see the future as you know more important in this case uh, in order to force DC. Right. Um, so we have been talking about this essentially one case study so far, but I essentially has laid out all of the um, formal definitions that we need. It's just that I haven't really properly introduced the subject that I'm talking about, right? Like what I said, uh, I'm talking about multi-stage game, and a multi-stage game essentially is a type of uh, dynamic game and can be captured by, extens uh, by extensive form games, uh, but um, very intuitively, we can cap, we can we can define multi-stage game as repeated, well, not as but as um, iterated um, normal form games. So a multi-stage game consists of a number of players n, and then a finite sequence of normal form games, g1, g2, up to gt. So notice that there are only finite sequence so far. Actually, in the literature, you could have infinite multi-stage games. In fact, in the Next few lectures, we're going to look at infinite multi-stage games. But for now, just to be simple, we assume that multi-stage games are finite. So they contain only finitely many stage games. Uh, and each stage game is a normal form game defined on all of the players. And then we're also given this discount factor beforehand, right? Of course, with a different dis discount factor, we're going to get different payoff functions. So I just want to have uh, a fixed discount factor. Uh, that are fixed, and uh, the, uh, I just want to have a fixed discount a discount factor uh, at the beginning. Then the multi-stage game can be re represented by an imperfect information extensive form game, uh, where the players play the stage games sequentially. And therefore, the game tree will be looking like a complete tree of height t times n, where capital T is the number of stage games and n is the number of players. So that this means that every stage, every player make one um, action, uh, and uh, the 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 root uh, rooted at any node on level t n, there is a copy of the game tree of uh, t g t. So this basically is just a formal description of the shape of that game tree. And for every terminal node V, the path from the root to that terminal V correspond to a sequence where each of the ST consists of um, the actions that are taken by the players at the T's stage game. Right, uh, and uh, the player eyes pay off at terminal node that correspond to this sequence will be the discounted will be the discounted total payoff, um, and uh, that will be uh, you know we have delta raised to the power of j minus one times f j i s j. We record that the first stage is not discounted, and then the se second um, stage is discounted by delta, and then the third is discounted by delta squared, and so on. So eventually, the last stage is discounted by delta to the power of t minus one. Right. So we have um, that total. That sum is our uh, total payoff at terminal node of this extensive form game. So now we're really interested in understanding the potential outcome of multi-stage games as we defined above, uh, assuming that the players are sequentially rational, then we are interested in understanding what uh, constitutes the subgame perfect equilibria of a given multi-stage game. Right, so now uh, we can see that uh, the diagram illustrates a conceptual picture of the game which consists of 
number of stage games where each stage game is just a uh, standard normal form game. Uh, and therefore, uh, for each of these standard normal form game, we know that there are definitely going to be some Nash equilibria. Uh, so is there any connection between the Nash equilibria of these stage games and the SPE of the uh, overall multi-stage game? So that's, this is what we want to understand. Right? So the first special case that we want to uh, investigate is the case where uh, each of the stage game that are within this multi-stage game has uh, a unique Nash equilibrium. Right? Uh, and this is actually a very uninteresting case as uh, in order for any SPE to be an SPE, we know that in any of the subgame that uh, strategy profile has to be Nash equilibrium. And uh, because for each of the stage game, uh, there's only a unique Nash equilibrium, so it's very natural to conclude that uh, in this case, this multi-stage game has a unique SPE, and that's exactly when all the agents are playing the Nash equilibria uh, at all of the stage games. Right, so essentially the uh, identification of Nash equilibria would allow us to find this unique SPE of the multi-stage game. Right, so this is quite straightforward, uh, and you can prove this by backward induction. Uh, so more interestingly, we would like to consider the more general case where uh, some of the stage games may have more than one Nash equilibrium. Uh, and uh, in this case, we have, you know, maybe the last stage game having uh, not just one, but multiple, say, for example, in the case of Prisoner Dilemma, Prisoner Revenge game, uh, even the even though the Prisoner Dilemma game in the first stage has a unique Nash equilibrium, the Revenge game at the second stage has two Nash equilibria, and that complicates the whole discussion about SPE of the resulting multi-stage game, even for a very simple two-stage game that we have presented. So first of all, uh, we can, um, it's very difficult to capture which are exactly those SPEs of the multi-stage game uh, in the general scenario, but at least we know for sure uh, that uh, there are some outcome of the game that um, actually are part of an SPE. Uh, in particular, if you play uh, the game in a certain way, you can make sure that in some of the SPEs of the game would uh, have the players playing in the Nash equilibria of the stage games. Right, so it's this connection. There's still some connection between Nash equilibria of the stage games and the overall multi-stage uh, multi game. So now consider a multi-stage game with T stages. And for every stage game, say the T stage game, suppose we can identify a Nash equilibrium strategy profile. Right. Uh, so, and this is just for this uh, static uh, stage game, GT. Uh, then uh, there exists an SP in, in the multi-stage game in which the Nash equilibrium path, no, sorry, the, in which the equilibrium path coincides with the path that is generated by the Nash equilibria of all of the stage games. By the equilibrium path, I mean um, essentially the actual gameplay uh, that are conducted by the players according to their separate strategies, right? Remember, a strategy defines a function that maps from information sets to actions. And there may be a lot of action that are chosen at different information sets, but these information sets are, are never going to be encountered during the gameplay. So when we are actually looking at the, uh, the gameplay, the eventual gameplay, that will correspond to a path in the game tree. And this path is what we call the equilibrium path. Uh, 
right? So the proposition says that、um, you can always find strategies for the players of the multi-stage game, so that in the equilibrium pass, it will look like that they are all playing the natural equilibria in the stage games, right?、Um, <clears throat> Translated to the example of um, uh, of uh, the Prisoner of Revenge game,、uh, we have the Nash Equilibrium in the first game, which is playing mutual defection, and then in the second game we have two Nash Nash Equilibria. Right, so we can just pick any Nash Equilibria in the second game. For example, they both leave. Uh, and then,、uh, combined with the Nash equilibrium in the first game,、uh, the theorem says that、uh, we can always have a strategy profile of the players of the multi-stage game, so that in the equilibrium part, so in the actual game play, the players will first play mutual defection, and then they will play mutual leave in the second stage. Right. So.、Um, How do we prove this、uh, theorem? Is actually quite、um, intuitive, although the proof can be worded in a very technical way.、Um, it, it just look can can look like a very technical proof,、um, but it's actually not. So basically, what we need is to identify the strategy profile that give us the desired equilibrium pass, and this is quite easy. You just、um, take any stage game. Uh, and then you assume that from all of the information sets、uh, of a player, this player will always choose the、uh, action which is in the Nash equilibrium. Right. So in this sense, regardless of the information set, regardless how the game reach the stage, so the 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 history doesn't really matter. So as soon as we reach the stage,、um, all the player would just play this particular Nash equilibrium. Right, and、uh, all we need to do is to check that this particular strategy profile, which dictates the players' actions, correspond to an SPE of the multi-stage game, and this can be proved using induction, starting from the last level, so starting from the last stage in the multi-stage game, and iteratively we go forward、uh, to the earlier stages. And eventually, we see that the、um, actions, as dictated by the strategies, actually corresponding to Nash equilibria、uh, in all of the sub、um, games of the multi-stage game,、uh, and that、uh, finishes the proof. So I'm not going to、uh, read out the proof, but you can read、uh, the slide for some details. So、um, one thing that so so if you if you consider the theorem, it's also saying that there is a clear connection between Nash equilibria of the stage games and SPE in the multi-stage game.、Um, but as we have shown in the、uh, example earlier, we see that there are clearly also some SPE of the multi-stage game where in the corresponding Stage games, the player are actually not adopting the Nash equilibrium of that stage game, right? So、uh, you can somehow enforce、uh, non-optimal stage actions, so stage-wise actions,、um, but、uh, nevertheless you will form an SPE of the entire game. So there are,、uh, you know, possibility of, of this form,、um, and therefore is、uh, it means that. Deciding whether a strategy profile is an SPE of the multi-stage game is actually a com、uh, complicated task, right? So now the question is, how do we actually do this? How do we check if a given behavioral strategy profile is indeed an SPE of the multi-stage game, right?、Uh, and、uh, For a two-stage game, this can be an easy task, as、um, we have demonstrated through the example. You just need to draw out the entire tree,、uh, and whenever in the first stage、uh, we see actions that are not following Nash equilibria,、uh, what we need to do with is we just look at、uh, the second stage and combine the first stage with the second stage and look at the eventual、uh, 
um, payoffs. But you can think of um, the situation will get more complicated when we have more stages. For example, if all the if there are two players and all the um, at all the stages, the player only have two actions uh, to choose from. Even in in that simple case, uh, if we are starting at any particular stage i, uh, and then we are deciding whether an action for a player is the best response to the opponent's um, actions, it, it seems like we have to um, check. Uh, an exponentially many uh, potential actions because at stage i, not only we check the action at stage i, we also need to check actions at stage i plus one, i plus two, all the way down to the very last stage. Um, so the number of potentially the number of um, paths that we have to look through is 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 exponential in terms of the number of stages from i to the end uh, stage. Right, so that sounds like a very complicated task. Um, but um, in fact, in the next result, I'm going to show you that we do not need that. So in fact, uh, we can uh, omit all of the stages after the stage that we are currently interested in. So this means that if we are checking at a particular stage game, say stage i, we only need to consider our actions at that stage. We don't need to consider any actions after that stage. So this may sound like a very technical result, but it uh, allows us to have a efficient and very simple algorithm to decide that for any given strategy profile, whether that corresponds to an SPE in the multi-stage game, right? Uh, to present this algorithm, we will need to fix a number of terminologies. Uh, first of all, uh, we are going to focus on behavioral strategies here. So it's a, it's a more general setting than pure strategies. Uh, just be consistent with the uh, notation that I used so far. A behavioral strategy profile is uh, represented by a tuple of strategies for every agent. And then I'm using the uh, bar notation to denote the uh, behavioral strategies of all of the opponents. And then if I fix the strategy profile of the opponents of player i, then I can define this function vi uh, to denote the uh, expected payoff of player i from playing according to sigma i which is the behavior strategy of player i at an information set H, right? Of course, this is given that uh, the opponent's strategy sigma i bar has been fixed, right? So that's our expected payoff vi. And then I can use uh, another notation to uh, denote uh, a slight deviation from the strategy sigma i. So I, I have sigma i, which is a existing strategy, and then I fix an information set h and an action a, which is available at h, and then I write a and h as a superscript. Uh, so I can define this new uh, strategy sigma i a h as a strategy which is following almost exactly as in sigma i, but the only difference it may be is when we are at information set h, uh, and instead of following what sigma i says, uh, the this new strategy just uh, um, asks the player i to choose the action a. Right, so formally you can see that uh, in any other cases, sigma i a h is exactly the same as sigma i. The only difference is when h prime is equal to h and a is equal to a, a prime, where this value is equal to one. And one means that with 100% probability, we're going to adopt the strategy a prime, right? And this is uh, essentially, you can think of it as a one stage deviation of sigma i. So it deviates from sigma i only at that single information set. 
And uh, how do we decide whether a given behavioral strategy profiles at SPE? We go into this loop, uh, and this loop checks for everybody. So for every agent in the game, uh, we'll examine every information set uh, that belongs to this player I. And uh, what we do is we look uh, at all of the actions of player I that are available at this information set, and then we see whether it's possible to improve the expected payoff for player I if player I switch to play action A at that information set instead. Right. So formally, we're comparing the value of vi of sigma ih with vi of sigma i with superscript ah at information set h. And if the light latter is bigger than the former, uh, we stop and declare that sigma star is not an SPE. Uh, and this is reasonable because sigma i uh, if this is indeed true, then sigma i is not the best response for player i, right? Because he can improve his payoff by switching to the action a, right? Uh, so we do this for every information set of player i, and if this is not found to be true, uh, and then we repeat uh, this entire test for every agent, right? So in Suppose that throughout the process, we do not stop and declare sigma star to be not an SPE, then this means that sigma star has passed our test and it is indeed an SPE. So we declare that it is an SPE, right? You can see that uh, it is actually checking SPE by comparing the given strategy profile with the one stage deviations. Right, and one stage deviation are almost the same as the original strategy, except at that own single information set. Right, so why does the algorithm work? Why is it that the algorithm correctly tells whether a given behavior strategy profile is an SPE? Well, this is based on uh, a very important principle, which we call the one stage deviation principle. To present this principle will make some definitions a strategy sigma i is improvable at information set h if you can find a uh, one stage deviation at that information set which supposedly give the player i a higher payoff so if for some action a player i will get a higher expected payoff than play according to sigma i so this is when uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, the meaning of when we say sigma i is improvable. And then we uh, can define, you know, a, a strategy sigma i as one stage unimprovable if sigma i is not improvable at any given information set. Right? Essentially, that is what we checked for uh, at, during the algorithm, right? We, we're basically checking whether sigma i is improvable or not. Uh, and if it passes the test, it means that it's uh, one stage unimprovable. And this is for sigma i, right? For that particular agent i. Uh, but remember, in the algorithm, we do this for all the players. And now, uh, the reason why the algorithm is correct and because of what I said is the next theorem, the so one-stage deviation principle, it says that a one-stage unimprovable strategy must be player I's best response to the opponent's strategies. Right? So this means that uh, in order to check whether that sigma I is the best response, you don't need to look at all of the other potential strategies for player I, you only need to look at these potentially, you know, one stage uh, deviations that are that are potentially better than sigma I. And if you cannot find any one stage deviation that's better, uh, then you can say that okay, the sigma I is the best response. Right. So this is uh, reducing the complexity of the problem to just checking these one stage um, deviations. So why is this principle true? Uh, this can be proved by contradiction, and it's not hard at all. So suppose a one-stage unimprovable strategy is not a best response to sigma 
I barf, that's the opponent's strategies. And since there are finally many stage games, there must be a finite number of deviations to improve upon sigma i because you know sigma i uh, can be somehow uh, beat by other strategies. Uh, and then what we do is, you know, there are only finally many stages, so we take the very last stage game where such deviation occurs. Right at that deviation moment, um, sigma i would not be. Uh, better than the other strategy, and the other strategy will be essentially a one-stage deviation, right? So in that sub-game, starting from this stage game, player I, in fact, is improvable by a one-stage deviation, but that contradicts the assumption that it is one-stage unimprovable, right? So we got this contradiction, and therefore we know that uh, a one-stage unimprovable strategy must be a best response, right? So and this. Uh, basically finishes the correctness of the algorithm. And just to summarize today's lecture, we've defined the notion of a multi-stage game. Essentially, it's a special case of an extensive form game, and it can be presented by listing a number of normal form stage games. And uh, we've demonstrated there are obvious connections between SPE and multi-stage uh, of the multi-stage game and Nash equilibrium in all those stage game in particular the Nash equilibrium of those stage games essentially um, forms some SPEs of the multi-stage game but through examples we've demonstrated that there are other SPEs potentially in the multi-stage game that um, if you look at each of the stage games if you restrict uh, the SPE on the stage games, uh, they are not corresponding to any Nash equilibria uh, in the in some of the stage games. So uh, that shows that in the multi-stage case, this problem can be very, very, um, very much more complex than just looking at the individual stage games. And of course, uh, we've also demonstrated through examples that um, the SPEs of the multi-stage game are affected by the discount factor. Right? Uh, and uh, we've also looked at the problem of deciding whether a given behavior strategy is an SPE, and this can be checked quite easily by looking at the one-stage deviation because of the one-stage deviation principle. Right? And uh, this finishes today's lecture, and I'll see you in the le next lecture.